Medical nightmare, the coronavirus outbreak. China's president now warning of a, quote, grave situation. More than 50 million people on a travel lockdown in Wuhan, the center of the epidemic, and surrounding cities. The streets there in eerie ghost town tonight, while officials here at home brace for the worst. On alert for signs of the virus. At least two confirmed cases with dozens more possibly investigated across 22 states. Here's ABC's Kaylee Hartong. Tonight, concern growing in the United States. Officials saying they expect more people will contract the dangerous new disease. Passengers on flights to Boston wearing face masks. Everybody is wearing the mask because uh, they are afraid of getting infected by other people. In Seattle, Chicago and Los Angeles, reports that stores are running out of supplies of masks. Two cases currently confirmed. In Chicago, a woman in her 60s. She had cold-like symptoms, shortness of breath, uh, fever. Um, and many times it would present just like a cold, just like the cold or flu. And outside Seattle, a man in his 30s. At least 63 people are now being tested for the respiratory illness in 22 states, including three possible cases in New York. Symptoms include fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath. Tonight, hospitals on high alert. Dr. Jennifer Ashton visited New York City's Health and Hospitals Bellevue. So this is a negative pressure room here at the hospital where a patient with coronavirus would be cared for by specially trained medical personnel. They showed her precautions they would need to take. How prepared are you and your staff to receive a patient who may have coronavirus? We're prepared to take that patient now. Our radar is always set high. So we can screen these patients so we can stop it from infecting other people and the public. And we are in the middle of flu season. Kaylee joins us now live tonight, and Kaylee, officials conducting tests on the dozens who may have contracted this deadly virus, and we understand there's a, there's a new development out of Canada tonight. That's right, Tom. The Centers for Disease Control is conducting those tests. The results take several days to process. U.S. health officials say they will alert the public if any new cases are confirmed. And Tom, we are just learning tonight from medical authorities in Ontario, Canada. They are working the first presumptive positive case of coronavirus in that country. Search Tom. for survivors overseas after a deadly and powerful earthquake in eastern Turkey. The magnitude 6.7 quake destroying buildings, sending residents running into the streets and in the shadow of that rising death toll, moments of miracle rescues. ABC's Julia McFarland reports. Tonight, teams in eastern Turkey racing to rescue survivors still buried in the rubble. This young girl injured and trapped, a worker cradling her in his arms as she lets out a cry, a team miraculously pulling her out of the wreckage. And after a grueling 17 hours trapped in debris, an elderly woman finally pulled to safety in front of an anxious crowd. She had managed to contact rescue workers on her cell phone, telling them where she was trapped. The death toll climbing tonight to at least 29, with more than a thousand injured after the deadly 6.7 magnitude quake struck just before 9 p.m. last night. The moment caught on camera during the evening news. The damage leaving thousands homeless. This man says he could not go home to his village and that families had spent the night gathered around a fire covered in blankets. Turkey frequently suffers quakes because it sits on a fault line, but this one was especially powerful. Hundreds of aftershocks were felt, some as far as Iran and Syria. Tonight, the search for survivors continues. Tom? Julia McFarlane with those incredible images of those rescues. Julia, thank you. <laughs> Running battles have continued between protesters and Iraqi security forces. They throw Molotov cocktails and rocks, and the police responds with tear gas and bullets. After the week-long deadline expired, they've been coming out in numbers to choke major highways. It's a simple strategy. Disrupt life so people in power take notice. We don't want anything except the corrupt parties to leave. Because of them, innocents are dying. For how long can this stay the same? The Mohammedan Qasim Highway and multiple bridges across the capital have become battlegrounds. Although dozens have been wounded in two days of clashes, many here say they will fight until they see real change. We will not retreat. Shoot us with live ammunition, stun grenades, tear gas. We will not give up. We will force you to leave whether you like it or not. Activists say government heavy-handedness and intimidation tactics only strengthen their resolve. This is the blood of a martyr. He was hit in front of us with a tear gas canister in his mouth. All his blood is on the highway now. 
Whoever wants to carry on with their daily work, let them see this blood and imagine that the next one who dies will be their brother or father. These were the scenes in Basra. In 48 hours, the nationwide escalation has resulted in more deaths, over 100 protesters wounded and a further 88 arrested in Baghdad, Diyala, Dikhar, Karbala and Basra. More than 500 people have been killed and over 25,000 wounded since October. It took 48 hours after the latest escalation for the outgoing Prime Minister to comment. He assured protesters their demands are being worked on and also gave them a warning. If you have the support of the people, then why should you deprive people from going to schools? Why should you cut off the streets so people cannot reach their shops? This is not right. This has to stop. With no concrete steps taken to deliver jobs, basic services or candidates which are not seen as being tainted by corruption or abuse of power, the protesters are unlikely to see the government's response seriously. Many Iraqis are undeterred and say they will stay in the streets. The government can either kill them or meet their demands to end the protests. Osama bin Jawed Al Jazeera, Baghdad. Let's head over to London now for a check of the world. Ian, we are hearing about rockets landing near the U.S. Embassy in Iraq. Yeah, good morning, Amory. That's right. We are starting today in Iraq, where three rockets have fallen near the U.S. Embassy. Alarms were sounded at the complex this morning, and speakers warned those inside to take shelter. Iraqi authorities say three Katusha rockets fell inside the green zone, which houses government buildings and other foreign embassies. The perpetrators are not immediately known. Now, earlier this month, the violence escalated after the killing of an Iranian general, Qasem Soleimani, and a senior Iraqi militia commander in a U.S. drone strike. Iran responded to that attack with more than a dozen missiles targeting two U.S. bases. Iraq's parliament also voted for U.S. troops to leave the country. Next, we are in China, where a judge today sentenced the former head of Interpol to more than 13 years in prison for bribery. Meng Hongwei vanished during a visit he made from China to Fran or from France to China in 2018, and his detention shook the international police organization. Meng is among a growing number of Communist Party members caught in President Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign, but critics accuse him of using it to purge political enemies. France granted Meng's wife and two children asylum after saying she feared they would be targets of a kidnapping attempts. Finally, we are in Norway, where the country's ruling coalition has collapsed over the repatriation of ISIS suspects from Syria. The controversy surrounds a mother and her two children who have been living in a camp and were returned to Norway last Thursday night. But the Populist Progress Party rejected the plan and left the government. The foreign minister said the decision to let the former ISIS bride return was taken on humanitarian grounds. Now, the mother was arrested immediately upon her arrival and the children will be monitored by child welfare services. At Amory, many countries are struggling with what to do with ISIS brides who travel to the Middle East to join the terrorist organization. Only a handful of countries have allowed their citizens to return home, while others, like here in the United Kingdom, have taken away the citizenship of some of their followers. Yeah, it's quite a conundrum, uh, also because, you know, many of these women have children, and, and you don't want to see the children suffer any more than they are suffering because, you know, they're innocent. At the same time, you know, somebody pledges allegiance to a terrorist organization, what do you do, right? Uh, oh, a absolutely. I mean, it, it, a lot of governments are struggling because citizens back home, they, they don't want these people returning to their countries and possibly posing a threat. So yeah, it really is a struggle for these governments. Yeah. Ian Lee, thank you so much. We are following breaking news, deadly gunfire erupting in Kansas City overnight outside a bar that was celebrating the Chiefs' win. At least two people were killed, more than a dozen more injured. Police believe the shooter is among the dead. An investigation is underway. And in Honolulu, we're learning new details about a shocking rampage there. A gunman shooting, killing two police officers, then setting a house on fire, destroying multiple homes. Kena Whitworth has that for us. Good morning, Kena. Robin, good morning. Authorities believe this all started with an eviction notice being served at one of Hawaii's most popular tourist destinations, Diamond Head. And now today, the governor says the entire state is in mourning. 
The rampage began Sunday morning. Officers responding to a report of a stabbing inside a home in this affluent neighborhood near iconic Waikiki Beach. The suspect killing two officers before igniting a massive blaze responsible for engulfing neighboring homes, his whole house, and potentially ending his life. When officers arrived on the scene, the suspect opened fire with what they believe was an AR-15 style rifle, shooting at least three officers, killing two. I'm deeply saddened to report the tragic loss of two of HBD's finest. The violence reportedly sparked when the suspect, identified as 69-year-old Jerry Hannell, was being served with an eviction notice. Hannell allegedly stabbed his landlord when she tried to evict him later opening fire on responding officers. Then there was five or six gunshots, sound like pistol shots. The suspect then allegedly setting fire to the home he was in, soon igniting a sprawling blaze, at least seven more homes completely destroyed by the out of control flames. A trail of smoke stretching for miles. At this time, there are three persons who are unaccounted for, including the suspect. This is still under investigation. The ATF and FBI are on scene. Authorities are saying they believe the suspect is dead, unable to escape the home that he set fire to. George. Okay, Kana, thanks very much. The frozen continent of Antarctica may be far from the world's population centers, but what happens in the rest of the world is having a big impact there. A CBS News team recently traveled to the region with researchers and environmentalists. And as Roxana Saberi reports, they say more must be done to protect the area and fast. As one of the most remote regions of the world, Antarctica shines with natural beauty. But on our trip there, scientists working with environmental activists from Greenpeace told us this beauty is fragile and it's at risk of fading fast. Change is the thing that's difficult here, and what we're seeing is rapid change. Alex Borowitz tracks penguins by counting them one by one. We joined him and his team from Stony Brook and Northeastern Universities on the rocky cliffs of Elephant Island. These penguins don't seem bothered by us. Their natural predators come from the air and the sea. But scientists say with temperatures rising faster here than most of the rest of the world, man-made climate change is a threat to their survival. These researchers have found that the island's population of chinstrap penguins, named for the black line beneath their beaks, has plummeted by more than 60% since the last big survey 50 years ago. Chinstrap numbers have dropped across the region as temperatures have soared by more than five degrees over five decades. So when we see climate change impacting things down here, glacial melt, uh, warming oceans. Penguins do really interact with, with all of those things. One theory is that shrinking ice is also shrinking the chinstrap supply of food, shrimp-like creatures called krill. But there are also fewer krill to go around because there are now more whales that feed on them. That's a rare bit of good news for biologist Kirsten Thompson. Well, so far, we've been seeing quite a lot of humpback whales, which is really exciting. It's great. I mean, this population is one of the populations that's been increasing in recent years, thanks to no whaling in this area. But Thompson is also studying a new threat, one that's little understood, a form of pollution called microfibers. They're pieces of plastic coming from synthetic fabrics we wash, fragments so small you can't see them with the naked eye. Thompson and Greenpeace are testing the seawater for microfibers at the same sites they did two years ago. Back then, they found tiny plastic particles in almost all of the samples. Do you know what the effects are? We know that they're found in the guts of fish, and we know that, that in some cases that um, microfibers and microplastics can accumulate up the food chain. All the way to us, human beings? Possibly. Just one reason, Greenpeace says, we need to protect places like this. The activists are pushing for a UN treaty they say could lead to the creation of sanctuaries protecting 30% of the world's oceans by 2030. Pressure on the oceans is very, very high, and we need to turn that around because in the end, the oceans are our best uh, allies against climate change, and we need healthy oceans for the future. This pressure, they say, is man-made, and it's up to us to do something before it's too late. For CBS This Morning Saturday, Roxana Saberi, Elephant Island, Antarctica.
Penguins are having fun there. <laughs> they are. Yeah. For how long right. is the question? Yeah, no, well, but you know what? 70% of the population from one of the last pieces she did wiped out. Interesting. Very interesting piece. Yeah. It's a great reporting by mm -hmm. Roxanne. We need to start taking care of our home. Yeah. All of but us. We won't be around for another 250,000. The world's largest mining company says the bushfires in Australia have hurt its coal production. BHP Group says poor air quality caused by smoke has forced machines to operate more slowly. The company also said some staff has taken time off to protect their own property from fires. Earlier this morning on CBS and AM, Anne Marie spoke with Michael Mann. He's a professor and the director of the Pennsylvania State University's Earth System Science Center and is studying the fires on the ground in Australia. Yeah, so in fact, I actually came to Australia, uh, planned, uh, planned this sabbatical more than a year ago to study the linkages between climate change and extreme weather events. And little, little did I realize I would be arriving in Australia to see um, what is perhaps the most extreme weather that they've ever experienced in the form of these wildfires. Um, and I've seen the, uh, the impacts firsthand. I've seen the smoke in the air. I've smelled the smoke. Um, and I've seen the damage that's been done by these massive bushfires that have broken out across the continent of Australia. And it's not rocket science. You know, you take unprecedented heat, which Australia has seen this summer. You take unprecedented drought, which they've seen. You put it together, you're going to get these sorts of massive, fast-spreading, uh, extensive bushfires. Um, and this was predicted more than a decade ago. Uh, climate scientists here in Australia said that if we continue to warm the planet by putting carbon pollution into the atmosphere, um, that at the current rate we're going, by 2020, we will be able to see the increase in severity and extent of wildfires across the continent. And here we are in 2020, and we're seeing it. Uh, they predicted it, it's coming true. Uh, the predictions are that if we don't get this problem underhand, um, then we will see far more uh, extensive and worse uh, bushfires in the future. And so the good news is we can prevent it from getting worse, but we're sort of stuck right now at the very, you know, the very best case scenario with this new normal. This mm. is what Australia is gonna have to deal with. So for you, the link between what you're seeing there and climate change, that's a no-brainer. But we know, you know, the Prime Minister, for example, the Prime Minister of Australia, doesn't make that link. He may recognize that, you know, it's incredibly hot, but the link between human behavior and climate change, he's not convinced of. But here it is in his own backyard. I know he's receiving a lot of pressure from people who live in New South Wales. It, this is a terrible thing, but do you think that events like this, particularly the dramatic images that are being broadcast all around the world, these koalas that are, you know, frantically trying to get themselves uh, to safety, do you think these images and this event can serve to shift the needle a little bit, maybe put pressure on politicians to make some changes? Yeah, I, I think so. And in fact, I don't think that uh, Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister Scott Morrison's rhetoric um, is, is really connecting with people. People get it. They understand that what they're seeing is, is something they haven't seen before. They're connecting the dots. They know that this is climate change and they expect their Prime Minister to act to do something about it. And the images um, that we've seen now around the world, um, the, the destruction of these rainforests, um, the loss of life, and, and of course, um, these images of, uh, of uh, pandas, I mean, pandas, uh, koala bears, rather, um, and, and uh, other animals that have been uh, impacted by these unprecedented bushfires. Uh, this is sort of the poster child now for climate change. This is sort of a post-apocalyptic vision that is going out to the rest of the world. Um, and you know what Australia is experiencing is a cautionary tale for what we will see writ large if we don't act to do something about the climate change problem immediately. You know, I think what's challenging about the situation for a lot of people is they feel like complete, like they're helpless. Um, and I know, you know, your focus is there needs to be policy changes. The bigger picture is what we have to look at. It's not about your individual water bottle. But what can individuals do to make some sort of impact here? Well, you know, there are lots of things that we can do in our everyday lives, um, you know, save energy, uh, recycle, um, you know, uh, bicycle to work rather than drive. Lots of things that we can do that decrease our, our carbon emission, that, that decrease our environmental footprint, and, and they help out with this larger problem. And they set a good example for others. But ultimately, if we're going to tackle this problem, we need systemic change. We need policies that are going to shift us away dramatically 
from fossil fuels towards renewable energy and we need politicians who are willing to support those policies and unfortunately Donald Trump in the US and Scott Morrison here in Australia are unwilling to support those policies so what's the most important thing that people can do they can vote and they can vote for elected representatives who are willing to act on their behalf rather than on behalf of the fossil fuel interests. Michael Mann, thank you so much. Thank you. You know how there's this fear of robots taking all our jobs and then eventually becoming our overlords? Well, Walmart just took another step toward that reality with something called the Alphabot. Yeah, that's right, Alphabot. As in Alpha Dog, baby, the one on top who calls the shots. And it's about to go into action at a Walmart supercenter in Salem, New Hampshire. Alphabot's job will be to collect grocery items for online order fulfillment. Supposedly, it's 10 times faster than a human worker. That will increase productivity in the warehouse, drive down the need for extra hires during the holidays, and of course save on all those pesky expenses like healthcare or paid family leave. All those pesky things that humans need. Alphabot doesn't need any of that. It just whisks around the store doing its job 10 times faster than any of us human slobs. Now, Alphabot isn't replacing all humans in the supercenter. They'll still have a human checking the items and then bagging and delivering the order too. But as Walmart says on their corporate website, Alphabot will offer a transformative impact on the company's supply chain, lowering dispense times, increasing accuracy, and improving the entirety of online grocery. They say it will also help free associates to focus on service and selling, while Alphabot handles the more mundane, repeatable tasks. So they don't see it as robots replacing humans, they see it as robots helping humans, even though these robots will undoubtedly take away human jobs. And therein lies the question to me, what is actually helpful to humans versus what is not? Is it more beneficial for humans to be able to order their groceries online and get them delivered as fast as possible so that we barely have to do anything and have more time for other things? Or is it more beneficial for humans to have actual jobs that give them a sense of purpose and the sense of accomplishment, the sense of a job well done at the end of each day? Personally, I think it's probably a mix of both. It's great that our lives are more convenient and we're not spending 12 hours a day just hunting for food and washing our burlap clothes by hand. That would suck. But then again, idle hands are the devil's workshop. If we've got nothing to do all day, we don't feel so great about ourselves. And we start to do stupid stuff like surf Twitter and Facebook and decide we're experts on international politics. There's a line somewhere between having too much work to do and having no purpose at all. Not that it matters, really. No one is bothering to think about these things as apparently our species is hell-bent on creating the robots and handing over society to them anyway. At the end of the day, no matter what we think or don't think, clearly, we just can't seem to stop ourselves. Tell us about, about yes, I have. I've got lots to tell you. Go on, just give us... Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Is that your reaction to what people who want you off the spotty shortlist? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And what about you being stripped of your belt? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, uh, you must be very unhappy with that. What's your reaction to that? Jesus loves me and he loves you too and he loves you too. He loves these people in here and he loves everybody in the world. You All you've got to do is repent of your sins and you will be, get, be forgiven. And do you think you can win Spotty? Do you want to win Spotty? John 3.16, for God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall have eternal life and shall not perish. Okay, Tyson. Uh, any final any final message to those people who who have criticised you in recent? There's been a lot of criticism from people in signing petitions to the Scottish national people, to all sorts of people. Yes, yes, yes. Just give us just give us your take on it. Do you stand by your comment? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Okay, Tyson. The only way is through Jesus into heaven. That's all I can say. The A to Z, the Alpha, the Omega. Tyson. Jesus is the way, the key and the only way into heaven. Okay, Tyson, thank Peace you out. so much. Thanks for stopping. Thank you.